In the 90s, hip-hop was a turning point for the game. We called it the golden age of hip-hop, when the streets and parks were no longer the only place to hear our truth. It was our time to shine, with heavy hitters like Wu-Tang and Mob Deep dropping raw rhymes about life on the streets. And then there were groups like A Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul, speaking from a different perspective with their Native Tongues Collective. Our name was inspired by the new birth song, African Cry, just as the music from that era inspired new techniques in production. But as things evolved, producers started sampling old school tunes, taking us back to our roots. The 80s and 90s saw countless acts rise up from nothing to achieve mass success in a cutthroat industry. In those days, you couldn't just call yourself an MC. You had to have the skills to back it up. No internet, no money, no viral moments. You had to earn your spot. Even Hollywood couldn't ignore the power of hip hop, with movies showcasing both the fun and campy side of our culture, as well as its grittier realities. And while mainstream sounds may dominate today, there are still artists out there delivering that familiar sound we grew up on. Because hip hop will always be more than just a trend. It's a way of life for us. But let's not forget about the hidden gems in this artistic genre. We're shining a light on one today. A NYC-based hip hop crew with brains, skills, and determination to match any other names you can conjure. Yet before their potential could fully bloom, tragedy struck and shifted everything for everyone involved. Welcome to No Tears for Black Girls, crafted by renowned writer John Reedberg and brought to life by the talented Samantha Paul. Listen in, subscribe, or tap in on the Alive Podcast app for exclusive content. Have a case or topic you want us to delve into? Head to our website, notearsforblackgirls.com, or send us an email at notearsforblackgirlsgmail.com. Rushiandra Cooper, born January 5, 1973, and raised in Brooklyn, New York, was blessed with two loving parents and a life of promise. She excelled at St. Mark's Day School and Brooklyn Technical High, known as a standout both inside and out by those close to her, a natural leader with unbridled passion. Back in high school, she clicked immediately with Julio, who would eventually become her best friend. Rushi was a stunning creature, adorned in the finest fashions and radiating an air of grace. Her sweetness and gentleness were unmatched, yet she held an intense presence that commanded respect. Men fell at her feet, unable to resist her allure. And who could blame them? Rushi was both captivating in appearance and character. Rushiandra was no ordinary student. No, she wasn't just a mere academic success at Brooklyn College with a 4.0 GPA as a psychology major. She lived and breathed education, using her spare time to mentor underprivileged children who were not receiving the quality education they deserved. Her former professor spoke of how it pained Rushiandra to watch these kids fall prey to society's traps, lacking the guidance and opportunities that she so fiercely pursued. So she took action, immersing herself in conflict resolution programs at Maxwell High School and Redirections High School, where she gained the trust and admiration of the students. They saw her as one of their own, someone who understood their struggles because she too had come from the same place. Driven, focused, determined, these were just some words that described Rushiandra. In 1996, she even went through extensive background investigations when she applied to join the NYPD. The countless awards displayed in her family's Crown Heights home were a testament to her hard work and dedication, and everyone around her wanted to see her succeed. They couldn't bear the thought of anything happening to such a bright star. But despite her academic prowess and ambition, Rushiandra also had a talent for writing and rapping. Growing up in an environment surrounded by hip-hop culture and influenced by real-life struggles, music became an outlet for her and her friends. It was through music that she met her best friend, Marsha Davis, and another woman whose name will remain undisclosed for privacy reasons. Together, they formed a fierce all-female hip-hop group called the High Rollers, a force to be reckoned with in a male-dominated industry. As Rushiandra looked towards the future, 
graduation looming and scholarship offers flooding in, it was clear that her options were limitless. She was more than just a model student. She was an inspiration and trailblazer for those around her. And to her family, she was more than just a scholar or musician. She was the sweet soul and comedian of their home. The year was 1990, or maybe 91, but these dates don't matter in the hood. What mattered was that Rushiandra and her sister Marsha had been down since they were little girls growing up in Forest Hills, Queens. That's where Marsha lived, surrounded by trees and parks, while Rushiandra's crib was more uptown. But they went to the same parochial school and their families were tight. They rode through Catholic school together, then straight to college, still best friends, still mad clothes the whole time. Marsha had her own hustle on in real estate, but she shared Rushiandra's love of hip hop from the jump. Their goal as a rap group was to speak truth despite all the madness around them. They performed at local spots, built their rep, networked with other artists. People could see it. These girls were about to take off. Everybody wanted to see them blow. They just cut a demo with what they thought would be their first single. Life ain't easy. Some lines went like, Times is hard on the boulevard. What you gonna see? Who you gonna be? A doctor or a lawyer or a politician? Life ain't easy. Watch me grow. Let me flow. Never wanted. Always had. Teachers, non-believers, always made my moms mad. Many people told me I'll never make it. Six feet under in the lot that was vacant. I had to survive, cause the streets wasn't fair, but I'm still here. The lyrics spoke volumes about Rushiandra's past, giving listeners a glimpse into her life. Being up and coming artists, the young ladies were known for their support of other struggling acts. One night in December 1996, they headed to a popular spot in Jamaica, Queens called the Q Club. Their intention was to show love and support to fellow artists performing that night. But little did they know, this particular night would take a dark and devastating turn. In the wee hours of Thursday morning, as any normal night, Rushiandra and Marsha disappeared without a trace, leaving them face to face with a monster. Before tragedy struck, they enjoyed watching others perform, soaking up the energy and vibes of the night. As dawn approached, they met a man at the club and struck up a conversation. He seemed nice enough, and it wasn't uncommon to make new acquaintances at events like this. Nothing set off any red flags for these two young women, until it was too late. The man, who claimed he worked at Mama's Mini Mart, a 10-minute drive from the Q Club, was an intriguing character. He spoke of a bodega with arcade games inside, where people flocked just to play. Rumors swirled that it was also an underground gambling spot. He convinced the young women to give him a ride there after leaving the Q Club. Inside, they found three other customers playing arcade games in the seemingly safe and normal setting. But when those three left, everything changed. The front door locked and Marsha's heart plummeted. She had no idea why, until the man looked her dead in the eye and uttered chilling words. You're not going anywhere. I'm gonna kill both of you. Fear gave Marcia strength as she swung at the man, but her long fingernails hindered her ability to make a fist. His punch landed with brutal force, knocking her unconscious as she fought for survival. Marcia jolted awake in a haze, her head throbbing and her body in pain. As her eyes adjusted to the dimly lit room, she saw him, the monster with a sickening smile on his face. She realized that she was no longer fully clothed, and Rushiandra was lying unconscious nearby, also stripped of her clothing. Terrified and alone, Marsha clutched onto Rushiandra's hand as the man's demands became more depraved. He forced them to touch each other before brutally attacking Marsha once again with his hammer. Through the fog of pain, Marsha heard him taunt, Why don't you just die, bitch? After that, Everything went black. Marsha woke up hours later, 
disoriented and badly injured. She stumbled around the store looking for their clothes, but all she could see was a light shining through the window, a terrifying reminder that the man who had hurt them might still be out there. But then she was rescued by kind strangers who had been searching for them. It wasn't until later that Marcia learned they had been missing for nearly two days and that the man had stolen their car and crashed it on the highway. The car was found with a man behind the wheel before he ran off into the night. But for Marcia, the real horror lay in knowing that her attacker may never be caught or brought to justice for what he did to her and Rushiandra on that fateful day. In that car, authorities found blood and loose jewelry, evidence of a fierce struggle. Panic and fear consumed the families of the missing women as news of their disappearance spread, and so began the hunt for them. Meanwhile, the two sisters were still inside the store, unaware of the chaos unfolding outside. According to Robert Jackson, one of the men who discovered Marcia and Rushiandra, it was his friend who recognized the women from their photos on the news. His memory flashed back to seeing them at a nearby mini-mart in the early hours of that fateful morning, chatting with a man. Determined to find some answers, the men pried open the gate and entered the store. What they saw was a scene of chaos. Overturned shelves, shattered glass, and a body lying motionless on the floor. But as they approached, they noticed movement. Marcia's voice pleading for help from inside an arcade game where she had taken refuge. Covered in blood and barely conscious, she was rushed to a hospital where her condition was listed as critical but stable. Relieved to have escaped with her life, Marcia believed her sister was also recovering somewhere else. Little did she know that Rushiandra had not survived the brutal attack. The medical examiner confirmed her cause of death. Blunt force trauma from 19 blows to her head with a ball-ping hammer. The same man who had killed Rushiandra had also viciously attacked Marcia, leaving her for dead as well. But by some miracle, she had clung onto life and was now fighting to survive. When word spread of the heinous attack, Folks was quick to put two and two together. They knew it had to be Fitzroy Morris, a known player in the neighborhood who was always trying to charm his way into the club scene. Living at the Mini Mart and working for room and board, Morris had a taste for gambling and often made trips to Atlantic City where he used to deal cards in the casinos. The authorities wasted no time spreading the word and alerting the Gaming Commission and all the casinos in the area. And just before 1997 ended, a tip came in that Morris was holed up at the Claridge Hotel Casino. Detectives were flown out via helicopter, determined to catch the man red-handed. And they did. Found him playing blackjack like nothing had happened. But when they searched his pockets, they found credit cards and other personal items belonging to Rushiandra and Marcia. He couldn't deny it. He was caught red-handed. In a full videotaped confession, he spilled all the gory details of what he did. The news of Rushiandra's death shook Brooklyn and ignited conversations across the city. But for those who were closest to her, like Julio and her inner circle, there was only silence. The sudden emptiness felt like being sucked into a black hole, with no idea how to cope with their devastating loss. But despite their grief, Julio and others rallied together to support Rushiandra's family during this difficult time, and amidst it all, her family remained strong. On December 1st of 1999, Marcia Davis bravely testified in State Supreme Court in Long Island City. Despite enduring the worst pain imaginable and losing her childhood best friend, she still found the strength and courage to face this monster head-on and look him in the eyes with unwavering resolve. Marcia sat up on the witness stand, fighting back tears as she relived the horrific events of that night. Her words were like a time machine, transporting her and the entire courtroom back to the moment when she almost lost her life and her best friend lost hers. With trembling hands, she pointed to Morris, the man who had forever changed her life. She would never forget his face, or the terror he inflicted upon her and Rushiandra. But as Marcia's testimony came to an end, 
she locked eyes with him and yelled out, I'm still here, baby. The reaction from the rest of the courtroom was electric, as they witnessed firsthand the strength and resilience of this survivor. It took courage for Marcia to face her attacker head on and seek justice for her beloved friend. And that so-called man wasn't going to have the last laugh. On January 3rd, 1997, a wake was held for Rushiandra Cooper at Berrien Missionary Baptist Church in Brooklyn's Crown Heights neighborhood. Over 500 people showed up to pay their respects and share in the grief and sadness that filled the church. It was a painful reminder of the tragic loss that still lingered in everyone's hearts. Rushiandra left behind not only her sister and parents, but also a best friend who will never forget her. And on February 2nd, 2000, Morris was sentenced to life in prison for taking Rushiandra's life. Justice was served, but it could never bring back what was taken from them. Yet Marcia remained strong, a beacon of light in the darkness, showing that even in the face of unspeakable horror, one can still emerge victorious. The most disturbing part? Before Morris crossed paths with Rushiandra and Marcia, he was already wanted for violating a woman in July of that same year in the violent bed section of Brooklyn. And that's not all. There were whispers about a possible domestic violence incident with his ex-wife. Did anyone bother to lock him up then? If only justice had been served before, these two young women would have never met such a vile man. Rushiandra Cooper, just like her fellow fierce female rappers, poured her heart and soul into her music. It's heartbreaking to think that if this tragedy hadn't occurred, the High Rollers could have made a real impact in the world of hip-hop. And even if they chose to leave music behind and pursue other paths, they had that option because their talent, intelligence, and drive went beyond just beats and rhymes. Their intentions were pure, always striving to make a difference with their art. Sadly, We'll never know the full extent of the impact Rushiandra and her group could have had on the hip-hop community. But one thing is certain, they were well on their way. Rushiandra Cooper's funeral took place just two days before her 24th birthday. This year, she would have turned 50. May she rest in peace, and my deepest condolences go out to her loved ones who are left mourning her untimely death. Thank you for tuning in to No Tears for Black Girls, now a part of the Alive Podcast Network, the first black female-owned and operated network dedicated to amplifying black voices. If you enjoyed this episode, please show your support by following us on the Alive Podcast app, available on both iPhone and Android. You can also stay connected with us on social media and YouTube at No Tears for Black Girls or on X at No Tears for BG. Remember to stay loved, stay blessed, and stay safe. Until next time.